radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this uh, Wednesday, August 21st, coming to you from Barcelona, Spain. Um, what is it, going on three weeks since uh, being away from uh, Puerto Rico? It's been a long time, a lot of traveling, um, having a good time. We'll talk about that more either tomorrow or Friday, we'll see. Um, all right, uh, so today we're going to jump into the news, we're going to cover the news. Uh, I do have, uh, you know, time today, so open for questions. We can go longer, don't have a hard stop, so feel free to go all in on um, on Super Chat questions today. Uh, we've also got, you know, uh, got to keep uh, achieving those goals. All right, let's start. I, so I came across an article today, unsurprisingly, really, by uh, John Cochran. Uh, on uh, the issue of price gouging. I mean, obviously a big issue uh, given uh, Kamala Harris's uh, economic program and her wanting to uh, embolden the FTC. We'll, we'll talk about the FTC on a different issue in a little while. Embolden the FTC and make it possible for the FTC to go after companies that believes are engaged in price gouging, in particular with regard to the food industry, to uh, groceries and... Uh, and such. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, and we talked about it when I did the show, I think on Monday, about Kamala's economics. But I want to say a little bit more about price gouging, particularly because I was inspired by uh, what John Cochran has written. And I, I encourage you to go to grumpy slash economist.com and find this article. Its, it's title is perfect. Uh, the title is Praise for price gouging, praise for price gouging. And um, it's really good. <laughs> it's really good. And, uh, you know, John has a really good way of um, succinctly, simply, easily uh, describing economic phenomena and explaining them uh, to the layman. In, in, and, and I encourage you to follow him. I encourage you to sign up to, for his Substack. He starts off the article by saying we should praise price gouging. Yes, pass a new federal law, one that overrides the many state laws against price gouging. Because <laughs> as you probably know, there are multiple state laws around the country um, that limit uh, or, or outlaw, outlaw uh, price gouging. Uh, and uh, the way they conceive of price gouging. We talked about this yesterday. The price gouging really is an anti-concept. There is no such thing. But the way they conceive of it is uh, primarily, it, it, you know, if there is a increase in demand, let's say a natural disaster is coming, a hurricane is coming, uh, surprisingly so, and there is a big rush to buy and I'm using examples out of Cochrane's article, to buy timber, uh, to board up, board up windows and stuff like that. And as a consequence, uh, there's a huge amount of new demand. Supply is limited. So you'd expect just the laws of supply and demand prices to go up, <coughs> price to go up a lot. And that uh, a plywood, a piece of plywood, would cost a lot more money than it did before the increase in demand hit if you will. Well, I mean, that's just the laws of economics, but there are laws out there. Uh, it, it, I think every state basically has one that basically say, no, you can't do that. That's illegal. You can't raise the price. So if there is this flood of new demand, you just have to sell it at the old price, sell the plywood at the old price until you run out and no plywood exists anymore. Right? Same thing about, uh, we talked about this yesterday, gas prices. Uh, during a storm, uh, you know, everybody's trying to get out of town. Um, and uh, so everybody, everybody's going to the gas station. Demand is increasing. Everybody wants to, 
you know, load up their car with gas before the storm. The gas station raises the price to 10 bucks a gallon and people freak out and it's highway robbery and it's price gouging. And of course, there's a law that stops you from doing that. Uh, you know, price gouging happens in competitive markets. It's, but it's a shock that either there's going to be either restrains the supply or, as often the case, increases demand. Think about toilet paper during COVID. Do you remember at the beginning of COVID when we were all going to be shut down in the homes? Everybody went and they hoarded. They bought huge quantities of toilet paper and they hoarded it. And grocery stores did not raise the price. Now, some of them, what they did is rationed, which is the alternative. Uh, they rationed. They said, you can only get four. You can, but what if I really, truly need 20 and I'm willing to pay more in order to get them? No, you can only get four. So it, it is a disservice to the people who really need it and willing to pay. So um, this is a consequence of markets working, right? Uh, the, the gouging when it happens, when it's allowed to happen and placing restrictions on that, making it impossible for the store owner to actually raise prices during one of these shocks is incredibly disruptive and incredibly bad economically and morally. Um, as, as John Cochran puts it so nicely, price gouging is wonderful for all the reasons that letting supply equal demand is wonderful. When there is limited supply, then a, sharper, a sharply higher price directs that supply to those who really need it, the ones willing to pay for it. It's day two after the hurricane. Who really needs gas? An ambulance, police, fire truck, or a handicapped person needing to get to a doctor across town, or someone who could bike, take public transit, or walk with just a little effort to go see a friend. What jacking at the prices, what price gouging does is it forces you to think, do I actually need to go drive right now? Do I actually need this gas? Are there better alternatives for me? If the price stays flat, well, everybody wants to go get it. And of course, what happens then is you run out of gas. And then when the ambulance, the police or the fire truck need the gas, it's just not available at any price. Um, or think about those stores during, uh, during COVID. We all went to the grocery store and we bought as much toilet paper or whatever it is we wanted, as much as we could in, in anticipation of some horror where toilet paper would not be available and just hoarded it. But that was only made possible by the fact that the grocery store did not raise the price of toilet paper. Imagine if they had. Well, now I would have to think twice. Do I really want to hoard it? Not at this price. Why would I pay triple the price of toilet paper to get it in a, in a, in a, in a, a huge quantity that I don't really need? And the very act of raising the price means people will buy less of it, and it means the grocery store probably won't run out of it. So when I need it later on, I'll be able to get it. Now, we also talked about this yesterday, but also what does that do? It sends a signal to the market, to suppliers of toilet paper, hey, prices are high. We can make a lot of money. Make more toilet paper, get it to the stores quickly. So then indeed there never is a shortage. The same with the gas after the hurricane. Some entrepreneurial guy sees $10 gasoline prices. He goes out and he gets a truck and he fills it up with gasoline and starts supplying the gas stations with gas because, hey, you can make a lot of money at $10 a gas, at $10 a gallon. And by doing that, increase the supply, lower the price. So what you actually do by stopping price gouging is what you actually do is you actually distort the market. You create behaviors like rationing, like hoarding, and you create shortages. You create situations where grocery stores ran out of toilet paper, where gas stations run out of oil, and where Home Depot runs out of plywood in order to, you know, protect those windows. 
again, to quote John, uh, laws limiting price gouging also reduce supply. If gas goes to $10 per gallon, there is a huge incentive for anyone who has a gas truck to fire it up, buy some gas out in the sticks, bring it in and sell it to local gas stations. If you can't sell it for a good price and the gas station can't recoup that price, it just doesn't happen. Nobody does it. Supplies interact. A truck bringing in food really should get some of the available gas. But if a price gouging limit on gas means that the truck can't get gas because the gas stations run out, then it can't bring the food in either. A price gouging limit means the truck can't get a price gouging limit on food means the truck can't afford the gas. So it, no matter how you cut it, you're distorting the market and you're distorting the market even beyond the price which you're capping. Or for example, inventory. If you know, if you run a Home Depot in Florida or Louisiana, and you know that when the hurricane comes, you'll be able to charge a lot of money for those uh, four by eight sheets of plywood, then you might dramatically increase your inventory ahead of hurricane season, and you might have a huge number. Now, the hurricane might never hit, and, and there's a real cost to inventory, so you're taking a certain risk, but you know you can recoup the cost if you can charge a higher price when the hurricane, if the hurricane is indeed heading in your direction. But if you cannot charge a higher price when the hurricane heads in your direction, you're not going to hold the inventory. It's a cost. You're trying to make money. So you just have the regular supply, and everybody is worse off because of that. So um, it's just a, it's just a, a, a you know, a, a, a disaster. You, you know, what about the people who go out of state, buy some plywood, and bring it in and sell it for a higher price? Price gouging laws prohibit that as well. Again, limiting the supply. So from an economic perspective, price gouging is a good thing. Price gouging meaning raising prices at times of increased demand or shrinkage of supply. It's just the laws of economic functioning. And the laws of economic function in pretty cool, neat, amazing ways that, you know, Adam Smith called it the invisible hand. Uh, but once you actually follow what's going on, it's not that invisible. It's actually there. You can see the consequences, the first order consequences, second order consequences, third order, con order consequences, and they're all positive. Now, but you might say, what about the people who can't afford the $10 gas, right, to just get to work? Well, you know, can't they? Right? You have to ask yourself the question. I mean, it's not always going to be $10 a gas. It's going to be for a few days. You know, could they take public transportation those, during those days? Yes, it's going to be harder for them. Absolutely. But that's the nature of natural disasters. It's the nature of bad things that happen that it creates, it creates challenges. And if they have to get to work and they can't take public transportation, is paying $10 a gallon for gas for a few days just worth it, given the alternative economic disruptions? So uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, people feel like it's just not fair. Things are bad, and these people are, quote, taking advantage of us. But they're taking advantage of us in the sense of increasing the price. Actually, he's not taking advantage of us because, again, as I said before, if it's $10 a gas, you don't fill up the tank. You only buy the quantity that you need. That makes it possible for a lot of, a lot of other people to get the gas that wouldn't otherwise be able to get the gas. If you don't have, if you have price gouging laws, the, the gas stations run out of gas very, very quickly, or they start rationing, and then everybody gets the same whether they need it or not. Everybody goes to fill up whether they need it or not. It just, it just, it, it allocates resources in a completely perverse way. And, and of course, COVID was a great example of this, and the distortions were just incredible. Now, there's a sense in which during COVID, 
um, the government, in a sense, got it right. I mean, right in the wrong way, but, but uh, better, right? Instead of trying to cap prices and everything, and they, they did cap prices on rent, which was a disaster, but they did cap rents. But they didn't try to cap prices and everything. Instead, what they did was they just issued people money directly. Now, that created inflation, um, and so it had awful consequences ultimately. But in the short run, you'd rather subsidize the person who, quote, can't afford it from a purely economic perspective than cap prices that have all these effects on, 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 on the system all around you. But there's still consequences to subsidizing the person. It's not a, there's no free lunch, right? All right, I, I mean, uh, John has a great example of this, right? He, he tells the style, I'll, I'll read you this because it's, I think it's perfect. And it shows how much of uh, how this issue really is an issue of emotions. It's not an issue of economics. The economics is pretty straightforward and easy. So he is, and, and, and he writes, he says, look, you know, economy, politicians are just giving us what we, the culture, want. The culture is against price gouging. The culture hates business and corporations who, who make a lot of money. And the culture wants to blame businesses for inflation. They don't want to blame the fact that they got all those stimulus checks during COVID for inflation. They want to blame greedy businessmen. It's much easier, much better. So we get the policies, kind of the culture demands, and it's everywhere. You see this everywhere, and maybe you even see it in your own responses to some of these issues. He gives this example. This is, this is really a, kind of a personal example, but I thought it was really good. So he tells the story about um, uh, a road trip he was doing with his family 25 years ago, right? Before there were cell phones, before there was an internet, and he's driving from Chicago to Boston, in a minivan with four young children, a dog, and his mother, John Cochran's mother. And I'm going to read you. We got to upstate New York and needed to stop for the night. This was before cell phones and the internet, so the common thing to do was just pull off at a big freeway intersection, marked food, phone, gas, lodging, and see what's available. Nothing. We tried hotel after hotel. We asked them to call around. Nothing. It turns out this was the weekend of Woodstock too. As the evening wore on, the children were turning into pumpkins. Not sure what that means exactly, but children were doing badly. Finally, we found a seedy Super 8 motel that had two rooms left for $400. This was back when Super 8 motel rooms were about $50 at most. I said immediately, thank you, we'll take them. My mom was furious. How dare he charge so much? I tried hard to explain. If he charged $50 or $100, those rooms would have been gone long ago and we'd be sleeping in the car tonight. Thank him and be grateful. He's a struggling immigrant running a business we don't need presents from people who run Super 8s in upstate New York. But though, uh, but though an amazing, smart, wise, and well-traveled woman, his mom, she was not having it. Nothing I could do would persuade her that the hotel owner wasn't being terrible in taking advantage of us. <laughs> Again, the economics is simple. If he kept the rates at 50 to 100, he would have run out of hotel rooms. And by the time John arrived with his family, there would be zero rooms. The only reason there were two rooms is because the hotel owner was charging 400 bucks a night and people who weren't willing to pay that price kept on driving or slept in the car. He, given the number of kids and given the circumstances, was willing to pay that price. He needed it more. He got the hotel rooms. That's what price gouging does. Um, of course, you could argue that all, you know, capacity pricing at hotels is in a sense price gouging, right? When demand goes up, guess what happens to hotel prices? They go up. Price gouging. Um, 
so, uh, you know, unfortunately, these are the kinds of emotions we get. I mean, how dare he charge this amount of money? How dare they take advantage of our situation? It's exactly them taking advantage of the situation that allows the situation to be solved ultimately. It's exactly them taking advantage of the situation which, are, which provides some supply into a market where, for whatever reason, demand has just spiked. Anyway, so I thought we'd talk a little bit more about, um, about this. Uh, and um, again, I, I will repeat that I highly recommend subscribing to the Grumpy Economist. I don't think he's particularly grumpy. I'm not sure why he took that term. Uh, you know, I don't know John personally. We've exchanged some emails, but I don't know him personally. He seems like a really nice guy. Uh, and uh, I, I still need to try to get him on the show. That would be, that would be cool. But uh, he, um, he's definitely worth reading. Sometimes he gets very technical. Uh, so you will find some of his posts have a lot of math in them. Uh, you can get over that. and Most of his posts don't, uh, and particularly these kind of posts and his analysis of Kamala's uh, uh, proposals. Excellent, simple. He's a good writer. He writes a lot for the Wall Street Journal. Um, can't recommend him enough. So uh, hopefully you will all subscribe. We need this kind of, you know, rational analysis in our politics, in our economics, in our policy making. Him and Scott Lincecum. I mean, I'm not sure what exactly we would do without them. These are voices in the wilderness. I mean, there are others. There are plenty of others, but uh, they're not enough. Uh, people who can write well, succinctly, simply about economic issues and just give the rational, reason-based, reality-based answers and, and show the absurdities of so much of our, the policies that our politicians propose, so much of the policies economists of all people uh, actually propose. Okay, um, talk about Scott Lincecum. Um, uh, next item is greedflation. And he just had a great graph that I wanted to share with you. I, you know, there's not a lot of talk about here, but um, because greedflation is such a stupid thing. But I thought this graph um, is, uh, it, you know, is basically perfect in terms of showing how absurd this, uh, this is. Um, this is, let's see if I can, uh, yes, I know where that is. I think you can see the graph there. I, I am cutting, the graph cuts off a little bit there, but you get, you get the picture. Okay, so here's the graph. It basically shows the consumer price index for all urban consumers, food at home. So this is the price index for food. Food is the thing Kamala is mostly upset about. And, and Elizabeth Warren is mostly upset about. Food at home in U.S. cities, uh, these are averages, right? So between, I don't know, 20, you know, 2012 or whatever until 2020, uh, it, it's fairly flat. And uh, so Scott labels this part of the graph, or whoever did this, labels this part of the graph not greedy. So uh, between 2012 and 2020, American corporations were just not greedy. Food manufacturers is not greedy. They, they didn't try to make money. They're not trying to make money. 2020, COVID really brought out the greed in them. So you see the big spike in prices. That's greed. They're greedy, nasty, greedy people. And then it kind of moderates between 20, you know, 2021 into early 2022, maybe. And it's flat and, again, not very greedy. And then it becomes super greedy. Like starting in early 2022, they become super greedy. And that goes all the way up. And then somewhere around early 2023, they stop being greedy again. I mean, it's the same thing. I remember John Allison, you know, when the financial crisis was being blamed on, um, on Wall Street greed. Remember that? In 2008, Wall Street greed caused the financial crisis. And John Allison was like, huh. You know, so they weren't greedy in the 1990s and they weren't greedy in the early 2000s. They just became greedy in 2005 and six and seven, and that's what caused the, the, the crisis. And then after the financial crisis, they weren't greedy again. I mean, it is so stupid. It is such a, a ridiculous way of, of looking at the world and thinking about the world. Uh, the reality is that businesses are trying to make money. That's what they do. 
And that's what they should do. That's how economy works. That's why we live the, the relatively high quality and, and standard of living that we have. Um, I wish they did more of it. I wish we eliminated the regulations and constraints and limitations that limit their ability to even do more than this. But the reality is that, yeah, greed is what, or self-interest, profit motive, is what drives the economy. Adam Smith understood this. It's not from the, you know, uh, generosity of the baker that you get your bread in the morning. It's the bread is, is, is not made for you out of the good heartedness of the baker. Adam Smith tells us, I'm paraphrasing for us. It's from his own self-interest. He likes baking bread and he wants to make a living and he's trying to make a profit. And the same is true in any business, and the same is true in the whole food industry, and the same is true in every other industry that we're dependent on. And it's that profit that makes those goods appear in the stores, makes the goods appear in the grocery stores. And to try to constrain that, price controls, anti-gouging laws, and so on, is to destroy this amazing marketplace that we have that actually provides the goods on time, in the place we want, almost everywhere. And indeed, the more we regulate, the more we control, the more the government intervenes, the more laws restrict, the less good, the less the goods that we get are what we want. I can tell you that's true from living in Puerto Rico. I mean, the Jones Act and just, and just a corrupt Puerto Rican government and, a, and high regulations and high controls make, you know, grocery shopping in Puerto Rico really, really tough and unpleasant. Particularly now that I'm in Barcelona, God, the grocery stores here are fantastic, fantastic as compared to Puerto Rico. Um, even some of them are fantastic as compared, uh, the one in Andorra, we went to Andorra over the weekend, and we went to a grocery store there. I mean, the one in Andorra was fantastic by any standards. You know, it, it even made American grocery stores look pretty lame. So um, it, it's a wonderful system when you leave it alone. And it's a horrible system when you start intervening and regulating and controlling. And this idea that greed somehow drives inflation as a way of deflecting the reality and truth that what drives inflation is when the government spends money it doesn't have. And in order to spend that money, it gets the central bank, the Federal Reserve, to print money for it, which is exactly what happened during COVID on a mass scale, and that money got reflected immediately in prices, and th th all this correlates directly. If you look at this graph, it correlates directly to the effect of stimulus. Stimulus happens, prices then rise. More stimulus happens, prices rise even more. More government spending happens that is monetized by printing money, more inflation happens. We know exactly what causes inflation. We, we know what, how it works. Uh, and to pretend otherwise is dishonest. And again, I call on whatever's left of left of center economists. Paul Krugman, who used to be an economist, Stiglitz, who used to be an economist, all these people who used to be economists, if they could just remember what economics actually teaches us, <laughs> the truths in economics, and stop peddling this complete and utter nonsense, then go for it. Then, you know, um, then, uh, then that would be phenomenal. Then they should come out and against this nonsense about greedflation, this nonsense about gouging, and this nonsense about price control. That Kamala, unfortunately, is on that ridiculous path. All right. Um, one more graph, since I was, I've got Scott Linsicum graphs. I figured I'd show you one more. This one is not related to price gouging or to inflation, but I, I, I still think it's, it's worth looking at because it's, it's one that keeps coming up. It keeps coming up. Um, and this is the one uh, regarding manufacturing. So there are two myths out there regarding manufacturing. One is that America doesn't make anything anymore. We don't produce. We don't manufacture. You hear it even from 
some uh, free market people, right? You hear it even from some free market people. But here's some facts, right? If you look at the left-hand side uh, of the graph, what you see is manufacturing output in 2022, top 10 countries, billions of nominal US dollars. And you can see China manufactures more than anybody, no question about that. But who's in number two? The United States. But it's not just a number two. If you look at number three, three is the combined manufacturing dollars of Japan, Germany, India, and South Korea. You combine those four. Remember, India is the largest country in the world by population. So Japan, Germany, India, South Korea, all four. What they manufacture versus what the United States manufactures, the U.S. manufactures more than the four of them combined, combined. From three to six, the United States manufactures more than those four countries. Germany, manufacturing powerhouse. 751 billion to 2.6 trillion in the United States. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just absurd to say that the United States is not a manufacturing powerhouse. It is. The only country that has more manufacturing is China. And if you look more deeply into the graphs, then you will see that it's true they're manufacturing more in terms of dollar and quantity very, very unproductively. Uh, they add very little value. So they're doing the simplest manufacturing. If you look at value added per worker, per hour worked, the United States is way ahead of China, way ahead of anybody in the world. And then the graph on the right is just how this has evolved over time. And you can see that uh, you know manufacturing, manufacturing in the United States in terms of just output, right? It, you know, peaked maybe in 2008, even though employment in manufacturing peaked in 1979. The quantity manufactured, our actual output peaked in 2008, and it's been up and down since then during the financial crisis. It plummeted, obviously, and then it rose up again, and then it plummeted again during COVID, and then it's up again. It's only about 5% below its peak. We still manufacture a huge amount. Yes, we're unbelievably um, efficient at production. We're unbelievably efficient, and that means we can produce the same amount but with a lot less, um, with a lot less employees, with a lot less people. So, it, 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 you know, but that is a sign of how good our manufacturing is, how capable we are, right? Um, and uh, so we have machines and we have robots. Those are the things that actually uh, that actually have have taking jobs away in manufacturing, not China. We manufacture much more than we did in 1979 when a huge percentage of our population worked in manufacturing. By the way, that is part of a thread that Scott posted on, t on Twitter um, where he basically uh, provided a list of all the studies that show the economic harms of Trump era tariffs um, and shows also a chart of uh, how tariffs work. And uh, the bottom line conclusion of it is that Americans paid for Trump tariffs and that they were overwhelmingly destructive to our standard of living, quality of life, wages, um, and employment reduced employment, right? All the things that Trump touted as positives turned out none of them were actually, you know, they were a disaster. All right, um, remind everybody that um, you can ask questions, uh, super chat questions that will determine the shape of the show. It will determine uh, how long we go tonight, depending on how many questions you have. You can ask questions about anything. You can ask questions for $2.
you can ask questions for hundred dollars. The hundred dollar questions are particularly valued, uh, and um, we do have targets for each show in terms of uh, uh, a uh, an amount of money that we have to raise for each show. The show is funded through contributions of supporters like you, value for value uh, in a in a trade relationship. I provide a value, you provide a value in return. All right, let's see. Uh, we talked about price gouging, greedflation, uh, jobs. Jobs numbers came out today, uh, kind of interesting. So not job numbers, but a revision of the jobs created last year. So uh, between March of 2023 and March of 2024. And it turns out that the Labor Department is now um, assessing that there were fewer jobs actually created than they had reported in the past, and by a big number. So they have revised downwards the 12 months jobs by 818,000 jobs. That's a lot, which on average would be about 68,000 fewer jobs a month. So this is a huge downward revision. It, it's unusual to be this large, although it's happened before. Uh, the, the, this is, I think, the largest revision downwards ever. There was a large downward revision in 2009, which was you know, uh, uh, just after the financial crisis, which was similar, but, but also over 800,000. But this one supposedly is even bigger. Um, it's the largest downward revision since, since 2009, but maybe Maybe, yeah, it, it's actually a little smaller. So 2009 was a little larger. Um, very unusual. Uh, and uh, so what this means is while the Biden administration has claimed that during those tw 12 months, uh, on average, 242,000 jobs per month were created and what a robust economy. It turns out that the number of jobs created was more like 174,000, so fewer jobs the economy was not doing as well as the Biden administration would like us to believe, would like us, uh, you know, to, to signal out there. Um, now, you know, this is, this is an example of the fact, more indication of the fact that the government is not very good at actually measuring the economy and actually telling us how the economy is doing. Uh, you know, 174,000, 173,000 jobs a, a month is still pretty good. It, but it's not far from being a recession. But this is the thing, and you can see it already, uh, you know, capitalist spy is saying lying administration. But this is the thing. And, and you can see it all over, all over Twitter and everywhere. They're saying, oh, manipulating the numbers. This administration has manipulated the numbers to make it look like they were doing better than they really were. <laughs> I mean, if they were doing that, then they're the dumbest people in history. Because... How does it make any sense to manipulate the numbers upwards and then two months before an election, two and a half months before an election, when people are really starting to really figure out what, who they're going to vote for, to announce, oh, sorry, we screwed up. Actually, the economy wasn't as good back then as we said it was. I mean, that makes no sense. If you're going to manipulate the numbers in order to benefit yourself, if you're going to manipulate the numbers in order to make yourself look better than you really are, you don't announce that you screwed up two and a half months before the election. You announce it after the election. So, you know, this is not about some conspiracy theory. This is about incompetence. It's about you know, incompetence, or it's about the fact, and this is a reality, that the way they measure job creation is massively flawed, massively flawed. It has to do with surveys and all kinds of other stuff, and it, 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 it's, it just has... Now, you know, this kind of number is... It's strange that it's so big. It's weird. But again, if you were manipulating it for political purposes, then you wouldn't report the revision now before an election. So, sorry, I don't buy conspiracy theories. I don't buy this as a big manipulation. I, this is straightforward incompetence, bad methodology, 
people not doing their job, people not knowing what they're doing, lots of things consistent with the way we know the government runs. Um, if it is a conspiracy, if they were trying to manipulate the numbers back then to fool the American people into thinking the economy was doing better than they were, then these guys are pretty, uh, some of the dumbest conspiratorial anything ever, right? Which is also possible, right? Because uh, conspiracy theories usually blow up in the face of the people conspiring. Um, that's one of the reasons I tend to uh, poo-poo or, or make fun of or ridicule conspiracy theory is because, I mean, the people who are usually blamed for running these massive conspiracies are incompetent in every other realm of their life. Suddenly, they're super effective at running this massive conspiracy and fooling everybody and not letting it out. And, and, and now, you know, now they're, they're, they're effective and efficient. I don't believe it. Don't believe it. Um, no, it's, it's not a matter of math. It's a matter of methodology. If you understood the methodology, you'd realize that these things are always off. Um, and sometimes they're off by bigger numbers. For example, in 2022, uh, they revised the numbers upward by 462,000 uh, jobs. And they're constantly revising them. In 2019, under Trump, under Trump, Trump would never lie to us. In 2019, under Trump, they revised the numbers downwards, not by 800,000, by 500,000. Still a big number. So in 2019, they revised the numbers they had reported for the previous 12 months by 500,000 downwards. So again, um, it, 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 government is not very good at these things, and the methodology by which they evaluate and estimate jobs created is just massively flawed and massively bad. Um, so uh, this is not a Biden thing. It's not. It, it's just again general incompetence and uh, bad methodology. And this is a problem more broadly, if you will, with aggregate economic statistics. Um, macroeconomics, in that sense, big aggregate statistics, in that sense, uh, don't really mean that much. It's it's like the idea that, oh, Russia's GDP is going up. It's going up, you see? The war has not affected the Russian economy negatively. But that's, that's bizarre. The GDP in 1942 in the United States, if I remember my numbers right, went up by 12%. Is that because the quality of life, standard of living, and economic growth was, things were just amazing? No. The way GDP, for example, is calculated is um, by through expenditure, spending, uh, government spending is counted. When the government spends a lot, even if that's to borrow or print money in order to spend it, then suddenly GDP goes up a lot. And uh, during a war, for example, in Russia right now, when the government is printing money and borrowing money and spending a huge amount of money, and then GDP is suddenly up. But the reality is that Tens of thousands of men are dying. Uh, tens of thousands of men are, have been mutilated and uh, are dysfunctional. Quality of life, standard of living, human well-being in Russia is on a massive decline. Mass decline. Now, they've even been invaded by Ukraine. So GDP might be up, but quality of life, standard of living, and any other measure of individual well-being is way down. And that was true in 1942 in the United States well-being, standard of living, quality of life were down, even as GDP were up. So GDP, like every aggregate statistic out there, is not a very effective way of measuring economic success. Um, economic success should be measured at the individual level, standard of living, quality of life um, uh, level, not at the level of aggregate stats. All right, let's see. Oh, this is a, a fascinating story. <laughs> RFK, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is, of course, running for president. And um, Kamala, since Kamala has replaced Biden and the Democrats have all this energy, RFK is now supposedly being convinced that he probably can't win. <laughs> Shockingly, right? Um, and... 
But what is clear is that he does not want Kamala and Waltz to win. So uh, they've come out. Uh, and Nicole Shanahan, who is the vice presidential candidate uh, for RFK, also money is drying up. He's not getting as many contributions as he expected, uh, and uh, you know he is not doing well. He's he's having a hard time registering in all the states, even though he promised he would. And even though Nicole Shanahan, who's got a lot of money, is pouring money into the campaign, they just can't make it. So it appears that they are going to basically team up with Donald Trump, that RFK is going to endorse Trump, going to get some promised role in the Trump administration, maybe the czar, vaccine, the, uh, czar for vaccines, I don't know, maybe environmentalism czar, uh, and maybe conspiracy theory czar. That would be a good one, conspiracy theory czar. We should make him that. Um, so here's, here's Nicole Shanahan um, saying, uh, she says there's two options that we're looking at. And one is staying in, forming that new party. But we are on the risk of a Kamala Harris and Waltz presidency because we draw votes from Trump. Or we draw somehow more votes from Trump. Or we walk away right now and join forces with Donald Trump. And, you know, we walk away from that and, uh, and we explain to our base why we're making this decision. So it appears that RFK is not only going to drop out of the race uh, for president, but uh, that he is also going to join forces with Donald Trump uh, to, uh, you know, insane, deranged morons uh, running on the same, running together. Maybe Donald Trump should kick J.D. Vance out and make RFK his VP candidate. Uh, and... Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it just gets wackier. American politics just gets, seems to get wackier and wackier every single day. It, it really is uh, pretty stunning. So that is the fate of uh, RFK. All right, let me remind everybody uh, that uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions in this show. You can do so live if you're here on, um, on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, if you're on uh, Twitter, and I think there are a lot of people, um, more people actually watching it on Twitter right now than on uh, YouTube, you can come over to YouTube and, uh, uh, and uh, participate and ask questions. You can ask any question you want. Uh, you can make any comment you want. I will read it if you, put, uh, if, if you associate with it uh, with a dollar amount. You can also support the show by uh, doing a sticker uh, without asking a question. So please consider... Uh, doing uh, doing all of that. What is going on here? Is this working? Something's not working. All right. Um, let me restart this one second and see what's going on. Okay, I have to redo this one second. Give me a second. Continue my my piece of software. We've had. I shouldn't say this, of course, but. We've had decent uh, internet connections <coughs> for whatever reason. All right. The nice thing about the Super Chat is you get to frame the show. You get to ask the questions. I get to talk about the things that interest you, that you want to talk about, uh, in including things that you disagree with me. Go ahead and challenge me in the Super Chat. Here's some good news for a change. And this is good news that kind of reinforces the idea that we've talked about on this show before that probably the sanest part of our government today, the, the one area where there is some hope for, for preventing our crazy politicians from doing insane, thi insane things, is the legal system. It's our courts. Um, a few months ago, we talked about this. The FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, under Lena Kahn, a, a statist, if ever there was one, a power-lusting statist, if ever there was one, basically passed a regulation that forbade, forbade non-compete agreements. Now, if you work in industry, particularly if you're in tech, but also even more so maybe in finance, you know that almost everybody in finance, particularly in the hedge fund business and the private equity business, they, they sign non-compete agreements. Uh, the the, the uh, hedge fund does not want you to take your the trade secrets you learned in one fund and go work for another fund. The same with, with tech. 
Uh, you can go maybe work on a completely different strategy, but you can't work on exactly the same thing you worked with for one. So non-compete agreements are, are very prevalent in our economy, particularly in the high end of the economy, particularly in, the, in, in those areas where there's high compensation and there's high added value by individuals. Anyway, the FTC decided in its infinite wisdom and its infinite trust in the American people and the system of capitalism to ban, to ban non-compete agreements. In other words, to make these non-compete agreements illegal. They were immediately sued. Um, and a federal judge in Texas on Tuesday upheld a challenge to the FTC, ban on non-compete agreements uh, that was set to go into effect next month. So uh, he basically held that the FTC did not have the statutory authority to set such a rule. Um, he basically said, you know, Congress hasn't given you the authority to do this. This is not within the scope of what the FTC's permission is. I mean, um, um, he wrote, quote, the role of an administrative agency is to do as told by Congress, not to do what the agency thinks it should do. Now, again, this is very, cons this is very consistent with uh, Gorsuch. This is very consistent with the spirit, not the letter, the spirit of Chevron, of the anti-Chevron, of the, of the getting rid of Chevron uh, attitude. This is very in line with the spirit of, I think, the, 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 a significant number of Supreme Court justices who want to see the, the administrative state constrained. They want to see the administrative state limited. And they think that the administrative state is just out of control in terms of, in terms of its power grabs and its writing the laws themselves and its expanding their own authority and going into areas where Congress, in the statute, that permitted, that created the agency, never imagined they would go. So um, uh, this is a great ruling, uh, and uh, you know it will, it will, uh, it will, it will at least for now uh, stop this from going into force next month. Um, the FTC, of course, has said, "quote They will keep fighting to stop non-competes that restrict the economic liberty of hardworking Americans." hamper economic growth, limit innovation, and depress wages. Notice how the FTC is claiming they're there for economic liberty. How, how absurd is that? Um, nobody is forced to sign in on compete. You don't want the job, you don't have to sign in on compete. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. This will be appealed without any question by the FTC. This is probably going to, um, going to land up in the Supreme Court. It, it, it will be another, I think, major decision for the Supreme Court in hopefully uh, reining in the administrative state, which I think is the explicit goal of Gorsuch, and, and hopefully he has a majority in the court to get this done. The judge also ruled that the FTC ban was arbitrary and capricious because it was, quote, unreasonably overboard without a reasonable explanation. Um, you know, I'm sure people will argue with that, but I think the first point is the more powerful point. You know, FTC shouldn't exist. It should not be an FTC. The very existence of the FTC is, is a, goes against the Constitution. Okay, but it does exist. Well, at least it should be bound in its powers by whatever the legislature, which is the body the Constitution placed the authority to pass laws in, gives it. And if the legislature wants to ban non-compete agreements, I still think it would be anti-constitutional and so on, but that's its role. And the courts can rule as anti-constitution. But it can't just, you can't just have agencies, in other words, the executive branch, make up whatever laws that they want. You can't have agencies just this, just write law. Um, the judge wrote, and I think this is absolutely right, quote, the commission lacks statutory authority to retroactively invalidate millions of existing contracts. Yeah, I mean, where, did they, where would they get this? Uh, where, would they, where would you get this, um, this kind of authority? Certainly not from Congress. 
All right, so uh, this is going to the Supreme Court. Um, let's hope the Supreme Court confirms this judge's opinion. Uh, I think the judge is right on. The judge is Ada Brown, um, appointed by Trump. Uh, so another Fed sock appointee uh, that is making, making good, making good on economic liberty issues. All right, let's see. We had a few other stories. Um, All right. Um, uh, just a, a, a little bit of updates from the Middle East. A couple of updates from the Middle East. Uh, IDF announced on Tuesday, yesterday, that it had recovered the bodies of six male hostages that were being held in Gaza. Uh, all had been uh, all had been killed. Uh, it's not clear. By whom? It's not clear how they were killed. Uh, they, they might have been killed uh, during Israel's bombing of Gaza. Uh, some of them were executed by the Hamas. I think they were all alive when they were taken hostage. Five of them were ready, had been presumed to be deceased. The sixth, there was still some hope that he was alive, but it turned out he wasn't. They ranged in age from 35 to 80, 80 years old. Um, and uh, they found uh, they found the bodies in um, in the tunnels uh, underneath Khan Yunus in the south of uh, in the south of Gaza, and they're going to find a lot more bodies as they continue searching those tunnels, as they continue, um, you know, searching and then destroying the tunnels. And, and this is one of the things you have to remember. One of the reasons Israel is not just blowing up every single tunnel it finds is first they have to make sure that there are no hostages there, and, and it, 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 that includes uh, checking to see if there are any bodies of hostages there. They, the, one of the priorities is to bring the bodies home, even of the deceased hostages, bring them home, um, give families closure, the certainty, um, and, uh, and some people can get on with the, with the rest of their lives and, and with, with, with with the certainty of what happened um, uh, to their loved ones. But, uh, you know, there's some ho horrific stories. I mean, all of them are horrific stories, but um, in, terms of, in terms of these hostages. Uh, so Israel is not just blowing up tunnels. It is going in, searching every tunnel, making sure they've got everything they can, not only getting intelligence on Hamas, but also making sure that they get bodies, they get hopefully at some point, they'll find some live hostages, getting them out, getting them back to Israel, and only then, after they've cleared the tunnels out, are they destroying them. Now, also remember, the tunnels are booby-trapped. Some of the tunnels have Hamas fighters in them. So this is unbelievably difficult work, particularly given how carefully the IDF is doing it and, and uh, given the, the priority to try to save hostages and bring bodies home. So... Uh, um, it is it is not easy, not easy going. Um, uh, in the meantime, there is uh, the negotiations for the ceasefire uh, have reached a crucial stage. Basically, Netanyahu accepted uh, whatever compromise Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State, United States Secretary of State, proposed on Monday. Um, Netanyahu agreed to it. Uh, he said so publicly. Blinken said Netanyahu had agreed to it. Um, Blinken then flew and met with the Egyptian and Qataris who are representing Hamas, in a sense. Uh, the Egyptian and Qataris have basically said that there's no way Hamas is going to accept this, these latest terms, uh, that they would not happen. Uh, and uh, an official word for Hamas is expected any day now, and uh, the expectation is that the ceasefire will not happen. Now, you never know, uh, but now that Sinwar is really the sole dominant, unequivocal leader of Hamas, Sinwar is the guy in Gaza who ordered October 7th and um, has been constantly hiding from Israeli forces. Uh, he is a nasty, horrible, suicidal, homicidal nutcase, and uh, he does not want to cut a deal. 
he wants to go down in a blaze of fire. He wants the 72 virgins. He's willing to have as many Palestinians killed as necessary in order for him to get that satisfaction of going down a blaze of fire. He believes that the longer he can drag out this war, the worse, um, the more pressure the Israel will come under from an international perspective, the more Israel will be perceived as a pariah in, in the world community. Um, so he's going to drag this out as much as he can. Um, of course, the question, of course, then is, what does Iran and what does the Hezbollah do? Um, if there's no ceasefire, they've, they've been ho holding back on attacking Israel so far under the uh, guise of, well, we want to see if there's going to be a ceasefire or not. Well, if in the next couple of days we know that there's no ceasefire, what's going to happen? I don't think anybody knows at this point. Israel, uh, Israel seems to be uh, on high alert given uh, for, for an attack from Hezbollah and what they've been doing over the last few days, more so than in the past, is they've been targeting ammunition depots of Hezbollah. So they've been going after, and you can see this in the size of explosions, the amount of fires and the secondary explosions. As the ammo in these depots is exploding, it's almost like fireworks. Uh, you can see video of this online. So Israel's been targeting the ammo uh, locations of Hezbollah with the idea of destroying as, many, as, ma as much of the ammo, as much of the, uh, the rockets, the, the missiles that the Hezbollah have. They were much more cautious about this earlier on, primarily because blowing up these ammo dumps um, causes a lot of damage. And a lot of these ammo depots are in uh, villages and towns uh, surrounded by civilians. Um, often civilians that are not pro Hezbollah necessarily, but Israel in the last few days has clearly been um, has changed its stance and is going after these ammo dumps uh, every night. One or two of them are being exploded. Uh, I wish they did more. I wish they were more aggressive. I wish they took more of the initiative. But it does seem like Israel is trying to weaken Hamas as much as possible. Hezbollah, sorry, weaken Hezbollah as much as possible. Um, with expectation of uh, something happening in the next few days on the northern border. But we will see. So far, it's been not quiet, but the regular tit for tat. <laughs> this is kind of a funny one. Um, so you remember Hunter Biden uh, was convicted of felony tax evasion charges. Uh, and uh, I can't show what the sentence was, or maybe there hasn't been sentences yet. But he basically has now asked that the judge, uh, the federal judge, vacate the, uh, the, uh, the charges against him. Uh, the legal team has argued that the special counsel prosecuting the case was improperly appointed. Now, where did they get this from? Well, if you remember, Judge Cannon, in Trump's, in Trump's, is this the document case? No, yes, in Trump's document case, has basically ruled that the special counsel investigating Trump was improperly appointed. And, you know, if, if that special counsel, special counsel was inappropriately appointed, so is the special counsel that brought charges against Hunter Biden. They were both appointed under the same procedure. Now, I am not an expert in the law, so I don't know if this has any basis. All of this, of course, comes from a kind of comment that Clarence Thomas threw into a concurring opinion about presidential immunity, where he questioned the constitutionality of special counsels, or in the particular way in which they're being appointed. <laughs> So basically, if, if, if Judge Cannon is right, and if the Supreme Court ultimately agrees with Judge Cannon's ruling about the special counsels, this is going to vacate quite a bit, uh, and including vacating Hunter Biden's um, conviction. So not only will uh, the whole case against Donald Trump fall apart because the special counsel doesn't have authority to bring it, bring it forward, Hunter Biden's conviction will fall apart, not because he's not guilty, but because the special counsel that brought the charges against him 
was, uh, you know, not, uh, um, you know, not legit. Uh, the judge overseeing Biden's case uh, wrote in his decision at this point that, quote, uh, that neither, quote, Justice Thomas's opinion nor Judge Cannon's order is biting precedent, and therefore it has no bearing on the case. However, if it goes to Supreme Court and the court agrees with Cannon, it will be binding precedent, and uh, Hunter Biden will benefit from, um, from uh, what Trump has done. <laughs> How these things work is, is pretty fascinating, right? All right, let's see how we doing here. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, Candace Owen, and, and this will be brief. I was going to show you the video, but I can't because of my setup here. I can't actually show you videos. You won't get the sound, so I'm not going to show you the video, but it's pretty amusing. Candace Owen came out, I mean, you've heard about uh, how anti-Semitic she is, and she's come out with all this anti-Semitic stuff, and the Nazis are not that bad, and... Um, uh, you know, history judges the Nazis too harshly and all this stuff and a lot of anti-Semitic stuff and a lot of anti-Israel stuff and a lot of really big anti-Israel stuff. And the really sad, pathetic thing is she's unbelievably popular. Like a lot of people have unsubscribed and left her channel because of all this stuff, but it looks like more have subscribed. There is a real, there's a real... Uh, significant number of, of anti-Semites in this world, and many of them on X and uh, and are following Candace Owen, and uh, she is just nuts. Anyway, she has this video where she is unsurprising, unsurprising at all, defending Maduro in Venezuela, and claiming that no, he won a fair election, and. Uh, uh, Maduro is now saying that the CIA is going to try to assassinate him. And she's saying, yeah, well, of course, the CIA is going to try to assassinate Maduro. He's absolutely right. It, it's all a conspiracy. She says, you know, I don't like any politicians, anybody in power. But, you know, Maduro has a point here because he's arguing for these conspiracy theories against him. So she's defending Maduro, one of the most disgusting, horrible, evil uh, political people in political power in the world today, authoritarian thugs in Venezuela. Anyway, uh, the person who has been really going after Maduro in Latin America is Javier Millet, the president, of course, of Argentina. Um, Millet has, has uh, basically sided with the opposition of Venezuela, and has said Maduro has stolen the election. He, of course, Millet is very anti-socialism. He's very anti-Maduro and Chavez and that whole part of... You know, most of Latin America is sided with the opposition and against Maduro, including Colombia, which is a pretty left-wing government these days. It, it, pretty much he has no allies, Maduro, in Latin America. But anyway, Candace Owen is an ally, so she's siding with Maduro. But this, that's not the nutty part. <laughs> that's kind of just to be expected. Anyway, she goes on this rant about how she does not trust Millet. She doesn't trust Millet. Why doesn't she trust Millet? because he's got blue eyes. You know, she doesn't trust Argentinians with blue eyes. You know, because after World War II, who moved to Argentina with blue eyes? All those Nazis, who she seems to support in some of her, po in some of her podcasts, they moved to Argentina. So Millet's ancestors, she suspects, or she's implying, she doesn't actually say it, are probably Nazis, and therefore she doesn't trust him. She doesn't trust Millet, and she repeats this idea that she doesn't trust him because she doesn't trust anybody coming out of Argentina with blue eyes. Now, she's just, in Jennifer's terminology, she's just batshit crazy. <laughs> and on top of that, usually what happens with batshit crazy people, she's unbelievably ignorant and stupid. She's just dumb. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Italy, but there are a lot of blue-eyed people in Italy. They are. And uh, Argentina is dominated by Italian migration. 
Um, most German migrants to Italy, overwhelming majority of German migrants to Italy, with blue eyes, <laughs> um, came to Argentina before World War II. It's true that a number of Nazis hid in Argentina after World War II, uh, and uh, uh, Argentina did host under various uh, uh, dictators, host uh, Nazis in Argentina. So yes, it's absolutely true that some Nazis came to Argentina after World War II. But to assume that anybody today in Argentina who has blue eyes is a descendant of Nazis is just, what's the technical term? Batshit crazy and stupid and ignorant. And I don't know. I mean, if you follow Candace Owen, please stop. She is a nut. And it's getting disgusting. It, it, it's not even funny anymore. It's not kind of entertaining anymore. She's become this rabid anti-Semite, horrifically anti-Israel, anti-Ukraine, pro-Putin. Um, and, you know, as, as we know from other things, uh, uh, religious nut, uh, doesn't believe in dinosaurs, believe in dinosaurs, uh, was skeptical about whether the earth is really round or a sphere. Maybe it's actually flat and they're all being deceived. I mean, she's crazy. And yet, millions of people follow her. I don't know, I guess... I guess to get millions of people to follow you, you have to be batshit crazy. This is my problem. I'm too sane. That's it. I don't know. Somebody has an explanation out there for what, what the deal is with Candace Owen and why she's so popular. And I see people condemning her all the time, everywhere. People are condemning her. And yet, she did this thing about the truth about Zionism. And like, she had a million people listen to it. A million people. A million. That's Elon Musk-like numbers. <sighs> All right. Um, I don't know if you watched Obama's speech yesterday, the Democratic National Convention. Um, he's a good speaker. So I never appreciated this, I think, when he was president, but now I'm giving uh, public speaking uh, classes, right? And so I watched a bit of his speech. And he's got it down. He knows what he's doing. All right, the, the one story I wanted to add is just, it, it's just, uh, it's a little indication of, you remember yesterday we talked about people moving to Russia. And this is a little indication of what life is like in Russia, what kind of, what kind of rule of law you can expect to live under if uh, and when uh, people move to Russia. I got, I got a bunch of comments on yesterday's show. I got a bunch of comments on yesterday's show about um, supportive of the idea of moving to Russia and the opportunity that Russia represented uh, for a lot of people and how awful it was in the United States. Anyway, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd give you this story from um, Reuters out of Tbilisi in Georgia. This is the story of a 20-year-old Russian man who burned the Quran. Now, um, you'd think that Russia being uh, the bastion of Christian Western civilization would frown upon, would, would support the burning of the Quran, would be a supportive of it. But no, I mean, a big chunk of Russian population is Muslim. And the last thing Putin wants to do is offend Muslims. Uh, there is no right in Russia to free speech. There is no right to burn a Quran. You cannot burn books. Uh, so a 20-year-old Russian man who burned the Quran, um, his penalty was to basically be sent to Chechnya, Chechnya bastion of Islamism. Uh, and uh, Kud uh, Yarov, who is the monstrous head of the Chechen Republic, a real, real bastard, real bad guy, basically posted a picture of his son, Kudryov, the head of Chechnya, his son beating this man. 
Uh, he was sentenced to three and a half years in jail and was, uh, and was beaten by, uh, by Chechens. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the, the, the explanation for why he was extradited to Chechnya, Chechnya is part of Russia, it's part of the Russian Federation, it's a, like a state, um, was that that's where the complaints were about him burning the Quran. The complaints were being made in Chechnya. So they sent him to Chechnya. So under Russian hate speech law, I guess, right? Um, you get tried by the group that you offend. <laughs> that, that is going to go really well, really well. So um, Muslim get to tor uh, torture a, um, I guess, a white Christian because he burnt the Quran in Russia. That's the way they deal with these kind of issues. This is not a country anybody should want to live in. Not a place anybody should want to go to. It really is, really is bad. Really is bad. Um, let's see, what else did I, you know, that can wait till next time, that can wait. Yeah, let's, let's just hold off there. I'll, I'll keep some of these other news stories for another time. Uh, and um, let's move on to our super chats, and we'll cover those. And hopefully, hopefully the people who ask these super chats will, if they're not on right now, uh, will be on later, and they can uh, they can um, catch them. I have all the super chats. Don't worry, people. I've got them all, uh, and uh, we're keeping track of everything, and so so we can. We can deal with these. I've got all of them. Let's uh, uh, and feel free to ask more, um, particularly if they're going to be uh, twenty dollars or more. Um, let's see. Uh, let's start with uh, Michael. San Michael, uh, can you be rich and successful and still be a pathetic human being? Is this is this the power? of compartmentalization. Did Ayn Rand ever discuss this phenomenon of human psychology? Of course you can be rich and successful and still be a pathetic human being. I mean, um, I mean, it depends what you mean by pathetic human being, but, but, but and how pathetic could you be? But, but yes, there are a lot of rich people who behave in horrible ways, do horrible things, uh, and, uh, and, and waste their lives. Uh, they might have been successful at something. This is the power exactly of compartmentalization. This is the power of uh, being able to be uh, you know, effective and rational in one realm of your life and not effective and not rational in other realms of your life. Uh, you know, so it, it, isn't, it isn't surprising. I mean, think of uh, Dr. Stadler in, um, in Atlas Shrugged. Now, he's not rich, but he's definitely successful and he's definitely uh, doing important, you know, succeeding in his scientific discoveries for a while. But you could also say he's a pathetic, he's pathetic, right? Because he's working for his destroyers and he ultimately leads to his own destruction. So did Ayn Rand ever discuss this phenomenon of human psychology? Yeah, I mean, she discussed the Natalie Shrug with Dr. Stadler. I, again, I wouldn't call Wynand a pathetic human being, but he is a flawed human being in spite of his being rich and successful, he's significantly flawed and does pathetic things like supporting Tui, right? Um, and she discusses quite extensively his psychology and how he's oriented and the idea that he has come to, again, because of altruism, that the only way to be successful is to control other people. He won't be controlled. He refuses to be controlled so the only way to be successful if he's not being controlled is to control. And he can't conceive of the idea of the trader principle, of the idea of uh, uh, success through uh, trade and treating people, uh, treating people that way. So she obviously talks about it in her novels, but compartmentalization is quite prevalent in our society and being rich and successful in one realm is no guarantee that you will be successful in other realms as well. Like the most important realm, which is the realm of actually living, which is the, 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 the most significant of all the realms. Um, thank you, Michael. Let's see, uh, James had a $50 question. Okay. 
Uh, can you do a short segment or news roundup, including natural disasters and insurance? I'm moving to Texas from New England and realize that there is a huge difference in costs on different things in both places. On another note, thoughts on second homes. Um, wow, I mean, there's a lot that one can say about the issue of insurance and natural disasters. Um, I mean, I think the most important thing to note is that insurance generally is a highly regulated area and that the government, both state and federal government, intervene in the way insurance is managed, run, uh, in, in, um, in really pretty horrific ways. Uh, you know, some examples of that. Um, in California, there are obviously are earthquakes, and earthquake risk is significant risk. And uh, private insurance became quite expensive in California for earthquake insurance because um, people were building homes on in areas that were incredibly risky and the insurance company wanted to cover their risks. Well, the state of California, so a lot of people um, weren't buying earthquake insurance and a big incentive not to buy earthquake insurance was the idea that you know, the federal government, if there was a big earthquake and your home got damaged, the federal government would come in and bail you out. What's it called? The um, same thing happened in Katrina, right? The federal government comes in and it, it writes checks and it bails everybody out. So why buy insurance and spend money when the federal government will probably bail you out anyway? So private insurance companies, you know, in order to, in order to insure successfully ensure earthquake risk in California. You need people from all over California and you need very large numbers of people to buy insurance. Um, and uh, you need it from all over California. And then what happens if an earthquake hits a particular area because you've got so many clients, you've, you've got a big reserve and you can pay the people where the damage has happened. Because of the disaster relief that the federal government provides, fewer and fewer people are buying insurance. Insurance companies were finding it incredibly unprofitable to sell earthquake insurance in California. So, uh, so people were going without insurance. Uh, insurance companies, some of them were leaving the state. There was less insurance available. Prices were going up because there was less competition. So the state of California stepped in and said, okay, since all these private insurance are price gouging you, right? They're charging you too much money. We're going to step in and provide insurance and we're going to subsidize it. So we're going to provide you with cheap earthquake insurance. So the state comes in and what does that do? Well, that provides, um, that makes it almost, that makes it completely impossible for private insurance companies to provide earthquake insurance in California because they're being undercut in prices by the state. And then soon enough, all the private insurance companies have left the state of California, and the only place you can buy earthquake insurance is from the state itself. So when there is an earthquake in California, and there will be at some point a big earthquake in California, the state will have to pay it out, and we know that the state doesn't keep reserves for these things. The state is not an insurance company. It'll pay it out of taxes, taxpayer funds. So there'll be a massive subsidy a massive redistribution of wealth, sorry, from those who weren't in an earthquake place to those who were, uh, taxes will have to go up and, or, or, and, and it's a complete and utter disaster. All started from the fact that FEMA, FEMA, that's the organization I was thinking, FEMA exists and the very fact that uh, the government provides disaster relief. Same thing with floods, right? So there are certain parts of the United States where you cannot get insurance for flood because for floods because it's it, there's no risk of a flood it's a known certainty that the area will flood and insurance is not supposed to cover you for known catastrophic certainties so insurance companies just won't insure you or they'll charge a huge premium and in a free market what would happen is nobody would build homes in places where they couldn't buy insurance or where they couldn't afford the insurance. They just wouldn't buy the home. So again, the government steps in, and I think the federal government in this case, 
basically provides flood insurance. It provides flood insurance in the Midwest, all over around the Mississippi and so on. It provides flood insurance um, on, on, the, on the coast in Louisiana and northern Florida that tend to flood when they're hurricanes and everything else. And they are basically, they are these uh, um, they're insurance policies uh, that the government provides uh, that make it possible for people to live in places that they really shouldn't live in. They really shouldn't live in. Because the bad thing is going to happen. And if you can't find insurance, that's a good indication that maybe you shouldn't live there. So a lot of rich people who have beautiful uh, beach properties in Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, the panhandle of Florida, uh, and uh, under normal circumstances could never insure their homes, now have been insured by the government. Literally, uh, insurance policy by the government. Uh, and so you see this over and over again, and that completely distorts insurance markets, perverts them, uh, so that it, it makes it very, very difficult to analyze insurance markets, then analyze um, uh, what the risks are when you go to a particular place. I mean, the beauty of insurance is it provides you real guidance in terms of the risk you actually face. You actually face. And... Um, that is out because uh, of government distortions. You say, I'm moving to Texas from New England and realize that there is a huge difference in cost on different things in both places. Yeah, I mean, you're facing a different market environment. You're facing different, most importantly, probably, you're facing different regulations, different controls, and different sets of risks associated with, you know, uh, a, running a business or, or just living life in Texas versus uh, New England. I don't know what the particulars are, what costs you're talking about, but that's the case. And then you write on another note, thoughts about a second home. I mean, that's very broad. I mean, it really depends on your context, on your life. It, 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 there is no one thought on second homes. I mean, um, I think it depends if you can afford it. Are you going to use the second home? Are you, are you going to rent it out? Are you just going to have it there for vacations or whatever. Um, the biggest, I think, challenge with second homes is you have to maintain them. You have to keep them up, uh, which turns, which can become a major hassle. On the other hand, a second home is amazing because you get to live in two different places and you can shuttle between them and it's not super convenient. Uh, we landed up selling our home in California um, because managing two homes was too much and they were too far apart. California to Puerto Rico. Maybe if they were closer, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. We weren't spending anywhere near as much time as we thought we would in the California house. I'm spending most of the time, almost all the time in, in Puerto Rico. So it, it really depends on your circumstances, what you can afford, how much time you're going to spend in the second home. What's the nature of the second home? Is it just a vacation home that you go there for a month once a year? Or is it somewhere where you want to spend more than that? It, too many... Too many factors to consider uh, to give you any kind of uh, uh, any kind of guidance. You'd, you'd have to give me a lot more information. But really, you, you need to really think through the costs and the benefits. The, and one of the costs is the hassle, just the, just the hassle of maintaining two homes, uh, which is a real challenge. Thank you, James. Um, Ian says, any good book recommendations on business leadership? I mean, there were, there were a lot of good books on business leadership, but of course, the, the names are not going to come to me. But I, let me just suggest one book, uh, and that is a book by John Allison on business leadership. Now, I don't remember the name of the book. Maybe somebody here um, in the chat can pull up the name of John Allison's book. But John Allison, the former CEO of BB&T, a former chairman of the board who, who is now retired from all of those positions, except exceptional uh, world-class CEO, uh, took a little farming bank and turned it into one of the biggest banks in the United States. Really a phenomenal guy and a phenomenal CEO. And he wrote a book about, um, about business leadership, and I highly recommend it. So, so look him up on Amazon, John Allison, Business Leadership, and you will find the book. Uh, that's the one I would highly recommend. 
James with another question. Um, how do you think Wall Street firms and big corporations start their relationships with government that turn into cronyism over time? For example, how does private equity or hedge fund start small and grow through government over time? Well, I mean, let's say private equity or hedge funds, the same thing. I mean, the obvious way in which that happens is where does the private equity and the hedge fund get their money? Most of their money is going to come from pension plans. Pension plans are often pension plans of public organizations, of cities, of states, of, of institu public institutions. Uh, and those relationships can very quickly become crony. I mean, and there's a lot of laws because of this, to, you know, to avoid what, what they call corruption, but to avoid really cronyism. There are all kinds of laws about your relationship with your investors and, and what you disclose and how you disclose it. And, uh, and uh, so it's, you know, the regulators on top of this and they're trying to control it in a variety of ways. Uh, so for, you know, so let's take campaign contributions. Uh, you can make, uh, locally, you can make campaign contributions to your, to, the, to your governor or to somebody who's gonna become a governor. And then when they become a governor, they can allocate a significant amount of money from their uh, pension plan uh, that the government has a lot of say in into your particular fund. Now, that today is illegal. But, but again, you know, for a long time it wasn't. And even when it's illegal, how much of it gets done behind, you know, in ways that are not easily detectable, not easily uh, detectable. There's, there's so many ways in which this cronyism happens. And then, of course, Private equity companies, you know, they, they, they own lots of companies. A lot of those companies have all kinds of interests locally and uh, they can be helped by subsidies or they can be hurt by subsidies to their competitors or they can be helped by changing zoning or they can be helped. So the private equity is going to go to the government and ask them to do this or that. And of course, um, what do they give them in return? So the cronyism is all over the place. It's, it's in the source of funding for these funds, but it's also in how that funds are deployed, which companies have, you know, so you can imagine the governor of Pennsylvania coming to a private equity fund and saying, you know, I'd really like to see more of your, your, your capital allocated to companies in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, if more money is allocated to companies in Pennsylvania, um, you know, will be nice in terms of allocating more funds from our pension fund into your funds. So there's a million ways in which this can happen. And it does. It's all over the place. Cronyism at the fund level, at the finance level, at the fund level. And of course, Wall Street, Wall Street firms, right? They are so heavily regulated that by definition, they are interwound with the regulators. And uh, there are all kinds of ways in which the cronyism happens there. You know, one of the big ways is um, when you retire as a politician, uh, Wall Street offers you a million dollar job to come and work at the bank uh, so that you can help influence legislation that affects the bank in the future. You know that as a congressman, so you're not going to piss off the banks in advance. You're not going to pass regulations, let's say, to piss off the banks um, because you want a job at the bank afterwards. And the same is true of the regulators. The regulators, many of the regulators, uh, are expecting high-paying jobs at the firms that they regulate after they leave government. So the whole system is corrupt. The whole system is filled with cronyism. There's, there's no way to point at a start and an end point. It's, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. Um, and um, yeah, it's incredibly destructive. And there's no way to get around it unless you separate economics from politics, which is what we advocate for, complete separation of economics from politics. Jennifer. Is it healthy to want one's relationship to be based on a mutual exchange of spiritual and material values, both, and not just one or the other? Sometimes even pure business relationships can become deeper friendships. Yes, I think 
Well, look, first, let's just, first, let's say, I mean, business relationships, particularly if it's a business partnership, um, is never purely just material. There's always an element of, of spiritual, you know, benefits, spiritual trading, even if it never becomes a deep friendship. Uh, it, it, it has to involve respect and it has to involve uh, mutual understanding and it has to involve a lot of things. So, um, it, it, you know, you should want your relationships to be as broad and all-encompassing as possible. Uh, and uh, to cover both spiritual and material values. And I think, you know, a lot of good business partnerships do end up being deep friendships and uh, because of the respect you gain as a, as a, as a, business, as a, as a business partner. Um, so, yes, I, you know, I, I wouldn't see it as one-dimensional. People always say, um, you probably hear this a lot, don't go into business with your friends. Well, then who are you going to go into business with? Your enemies? People you don't like? People you have no respect for? I mean, the only people I'd ever go into business with are my friends. I'd never go into business with anybody but my friends. And my experiences of those businesses' relationship have always been incredibly positive. I've never had a massive falling out with a business partner. Um, so because we started out as friends. <laughs> and those friends are built on respect and, you know, mutual admiration and all of the other stuff. So yes, you want more, not less. Uh, Andrew, your comments on the economic dynam dynamics of price gouging reveal how understanding it requires conceptual and long-term thinking. Emotionalism is all one needs to blame greed. Intellectuals who know better should speak up. Yeah, I agree. And, and this is the thing. Almost all economists know better, but they don't speak up. They don't speak up because they have partisan loyalties. They don't speak up because they're afraid. They don't speak up because they don't like to alienate people. They, they don't speak up because they're just academics doing their job and they don't want to intervene. Or they don't speak up because they've been corrupted by the system. But they all get it. This is not hard. The thing about, you know, the price gouging example is you've got to be able to think long term. You have to think rationally and you also have to think about secondary and third level effects. And here I will recommend for I don't know how the nth time um, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Economics, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, which is a brilliant book that basically shows how what appears simple emotionally appealing, emotionally easy, actually has, you know, you have to, to see what it really does. You have to look for the second, third, fourth level effects. You have to look at the effects over time. You can't judge it in the point, and you have to think. You can't be emotional about it. So, um, so yes, economics can be complicated. It needs to be thought through like any other field engineering, you wouldn't build a bridge based on emotions. Don't have opinions about economics based on emotions. It's not that hard. All right, Wes, thank you for the stick of $50. I really, really appreciate that. Also, um, uh, let's see who else we have. We have uh, Mary Aline, thank you for the $20. Really appreciate that. Uh, Mike Dial, thank you for the sticker. I don't know if you guys are here. John Parker, um, and uh, and Stephen Harper, thank you all for the, the stickers. Really, really appreciate them. And uh, yeah, you too can support the show with a sticker. It's pretty easy. Um, you don't even have to ask a question. Of course, you can also ask a question and enhance the show by uh, the question itself and by getting me to answer it. Uh, expands the content. All right, let's see. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties, but this is what being on the road challenges, and I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened exactly. We'll figure it out for next time. Glad it's working now. Um, thanks for the patience, everybody. Let's see if this works. Why is this not working? All right. 
Michael says, uh, I disagree with you about, uh, I disagree with you somewhat on Benny Mars. In the past, he was awful, but lately he's been really defending Israel unapologetically. But you see, his defense of Israel, the fact that he's defending Israel unapologetically is really, really bad. Because what people then see is, okay, they, they see Benny Mars defending Israel, and then they go and read his books. And his books are full of distortions and lies. So I would rather he just shut up and go in a corner and leave. Or if he's going to defend Israel unapologetically, then he should also say, look, I made some errors in my book. I did things that are bad in my book. Don't read my book. So read my books with the caveat that some of the stuff I say there is not true. Or he write a new book that rewrites what he wrote back then. But the reality is that his mistakes have been pointed out by other economists, by other historians, sorry, and he is denied and he has refused to, to make any corrections or to acknowledge any mistakes. So it's worse that he's defending Israel right now because, again, that will legitimize certain of his evasions that are in his books in the past because they say, oh, this is written by a supporter of Israel. It must be right or it must be biased towards Israel when it's not. It's the exact opposite. So when you don't make amends for the past, you do more damage by defending Israel than, than if you just shut up and, and stayed out of it. This is Benny Morris, who's on a, who was on Lex Friedman's debate about the Israeli-Palestinian thing, and he's on a lot. And you could see how ineffectual he was in that debate because Finkelstein, who's the enemy of Israel, kept pointing out stuff that Benny Morris himself wrote in his own books. And Benny Morris at no point said, yes, I screwed up. What I wrote back then was wrong. So it was used against him, and he couldn't fight it. He couldn't argue against it, because he said it himself. So sometimes you have to dig a little deeper and think a little bit more in terms of the long-term consequences. Even when somebody is defending a point of view you agree with, what are the consequences of it being that person? It's like everybody says, you know, Trump was great on Israel. He moved the embassy. He did all these things. Yeah, but it was Trump. So... Uh, you know, the whole association with being pro-Israel is now associated with Trump. Is that good for Israel? Probably not long term. Who does the thing that they do is, is often, you know, really, really important. Okay, Michael also asked, in the case that you can catch, in the case that you can catch flies with honey, but you can catch more honeys being fly. I'm sure that's something clever there, but I don't understand it. Sorry, Michael. I just don't understand what, what, what is there. John says, do you have any comments on the renewed speculation around RFK Jr. dropping out of the race and supporting Trump? Yes, I talked about this um, in the 